Uh, my name is Luis Ferrero. I'm one of the hosts with the Dairy Nutrition uh, Black Belt Podcast. And today uh, we have opportunity to discuss about hypocalcemia and how to actually mitigate this issue with Rod Martin. Uh, first, Rod, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a great discussion across those two episodes. Uh, so please give us a little bit about your background so, so the listeners can learn more about you. And what's been really interesting through all my years of um, doing dairy nutrition work out on farms is that hypocalcemia uh, is still a big issue. And um, I started in 1986 in this business, and um, I certainly remember my first years out in this business, and the hot topic was down cows or hypocalcemia. And as I progressed through my career, um, we still talk a lot about uh, hypocalcemia, maybe not as much about down cows per se, but certainly subclinical hypocalcemia and some of the negative effects. So this has been a, a very interesting uh, topic for me. And, and, uh, uh, and like I said, I've been, I've been chasing this problem for a long time. And it's just, we continue to learn more and, and hopefully we can share some more information today about uh, that, the role that dietary fosters will play in this. Now, absolutely certain hypocalcemia is a key issue. And absolutely, there are a lot of research still going on across many different universities here in the United States, as well as other countries, you know, and certainly we have a lot to learn. But I also believe that we evolve a lot in terms of how we can fight against this issue, right? So could you give us, you know, a, a little bit of your impression on first, how hypocalcemia evolve? through the herds over the years, but also uh, how did the practice that we actually use in the nutrition business uh, change over time or help us yeah. to understand and improve that? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. And to me, it's a very interesting question because I've seen this evolve over my uh, my career. Um, my, like I said, my first year out was like 1986 when we were going to school in the 80s, uh, we were taught that uh, uh, you need to watch the dietary calcium level in the, in the diet. So you want to feed as low as dietary calcium as possible because there was research from the 70s and 80s that showed if you can limit uh, dietary calcium, you would help jumpstart that PTH mechanism that pulls calcium out of the bone to meet the demand for um, a calcium for that fresh cow. The challenge was when you really look at that data is that you really had to limit the calcium level, like less than 20 grams per head per day. The challenge with us consultants out in the field at that time, you could not get much, you couldn't get much lower than probably 60, 70 grams. It was just really hard to get down to 20 grams. But regardless, we still followed through and tried to do everything we could to minimize calcium in that prefresh uh, diet or the dry cow diet in the 80s. And one strategy that I remember using, and I still have notes on it, is that we, uh, there's a lot of alfalfa hay leach and hay being fed in the Midwest, okay? So <clears throat> when we fed alfalfa hay and hay leach, the first thing they kind of told us in, in school or the, or the researchers told us, you got to get rid of that because it's really high in calcium. Perfectly made sense at the time. <clears throat> and so we got rid of it. And so we replaced it with grass, hay, and corn silage. And actually, we, we saw some better results. Farmers were, were happy with the results. Yeah, you get some older cows with some milk fevers back then, but definitely an improvement. Well, <clears throat> as we come to find out, the uh, late 80s, early 90s, um, I've had a, I had a couple of scenarios on some farms where we're feeding a low calcium diet uh, for the dry cows, uh, but we're using small grain forages. Okay, like rye silage, I think one was milo silage. And, and basically when we calculated the diet, uh, the calcium grams were the same as the, same, same as the grams of uh, calcium as we had on the corn silage and grassy hay. So we thought, hey, this is gonna work. Well, lo and behold, I got a, a phone call and um, it didn't work very good. We had very high milk fever rates on those herd, those couple of herds that were feeding a small grain silage. And for me, it was very perplexing because I learned, I was taught that low calcium should take care of that. And we had low calcium in those small grain silages. Come to find out that the potassium level was over 4% in, um, in those diets. 
in those feeds. And that's when the call went to Jesse Goff uh, down at Iowa State, and who's the one that's kind of the guru of uh, potassium and negative DCAD uh, research. And basically, we started looking at potassium more in the 90s. So here we are in the 1990s. Now we're focused on low potassium. And then also potassium plays a role with magnesium absorption too. So then in the 90s, we start going on to potassium. And we we went out and procured a lot of low potassium haze, uh, grasses. We started feeding a little bit of straw. Um, we even I even got sourced a person out in the Dakotas that was, uh, uh, was selling us or selling producers prairie grass hay that was really low in potassium. And we started seeing some pretty good results. So, so in the 80s, we were feeding, focused on low calcium. And then the 90s, potassium and magnesium kind of came in into play. And then as we got it, went through the 90s and got into the decade of the 2000s, really started focusing on negative DCAD diets. And so in addition to potassium, we were balancing negative DCAD diets with uh, you know, sodium, uh, potassium, uh, chloride, and sulfur, and really kind of focus on getting a negative DCAD diet, uh, given, doing urine pHs, and trying to make that cow more responsive to that high calcium demand at, at, uh, at calving. And then <clears throat> as we got into the 2010 decade, we, we still focused a lot on negative DCAD diets, but then we started, uh, research started working on, well, where should the urine pH be? You know, some people thought the urine pH should be, you know, about 5.8 to, to 6.4. Other people thought, well, lower is probably, probably better. In addition to that, they, a lot of research, some out in Cornell was working on, uh, uh, well, maybe we should feed higher calcium levels in the diet uh, to make sure there's plenty of calcium available for absorption. And uh, basically, we're really focused, really focused on uh, the negative DCAD diets. And my experience is, is that, you know, we kind of had mixed results. Uh, some farms got along really well. Um, some farms had challenges, probably because of the availability of a certain type of forages and hard to get low potassium feeds in and, and et cetera. Typical fresh cow incidence of clinical hypocalcemia is three to 6%, while subclinical hypocalcemia affects 50% or more mature cows. Based on cutting edge research, Exelite offers a new approach that is build effective and the ZDUs. For more information, visit www.protecta.com. So in 2018, when I was working with this Midwest dairy nutrition company, um, there was a company from Denmark that came and talked to us about this uh, binding product. And, um, and they said it bound calcium. And so basically, when it bound calcium, you, you kind of replicate a low, very low calcium diet. Well, long story short, we started looking into to this and it basically became a more of a phosphorus binder and the research kind of really proved that out. So when we started looking at that, we started looking at all this uh, phosphorus research out there. No, it sounds great. That was a very interesting story, you know, and guide us through, you know, a lot of the research that went through that. Obviously, we know the research, but sometimes don't see those behind the scenes that you just brought to us. Uh, thanks yeah. again, Rod, for joining us today. And yes. for those of you at home, uh, we will continue to discuss more about this topic and make sure we learn with uh, Rod's expertise uh, for our episode to and make sure that you get some great tips about how to mitigate hypocalcemia for the dairy herds that you work with for your own. So thanks again, Rod, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you.